Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm wearing the other beads. Anyway, good morning. Uh, Guten Hagen. Ohio. Mushy mushy. <laughs> Wednesday is. What other languages? Bonjour. Ça va? Uh, anyway, just having fun. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your practice. Yeah. And as always, for your support. If you're interested in how you can support this resource not just these videos but the free podcasts and all the information on threefoldlotus.com there's a a large amount of stuff you can download there just print material and so forth to help you with your practice support your practice and help you have things to use to help communicate with others you know expand your own personal sangha within our international sangha yeah we are starting today the Sutra of the Lotus Dharma of the Wonderful Law, Chapter 1. We've just completed the Innumerable Meanings Sutra, which sounds like a separate thing. It's treated as a separate thing. Not all schools of Buddhism include it in the Lotus Sutra. But as we explore together, and I demonstrated, Innumerable meanings is a quality of the Lotus Sutra. So it really is the preamble, the, the prologue of the Lotus Sutra. What, what comes to the fore in the Lotus Sutra proper is not only its innumerable meanings via every sentient mind that grasps it, looks for insights and meaning in it, to pursue one's own individual path to Buddha. But that the lotus is, the, the flower of the lotus, is the central symbolic Saha world physical example of the immediacy of invoking enlightenment and experiencing enlightenment. This is the Daimoku. This is the Sutra is about this moment, this method of enlightening, opening the Buddha eye within this Saha world. Displacing, if you will, the samsara mind of attachments and categorization and the warehouse of data right? I've talked about many, many times. Not getting rid of all the stuff, not getting rid of uh, difficulties and obstacles and, and, you know, life. Life is messy. But you don't have to experience it as messy. Because you can stand outside of the roiling water of the rapids and still Feel, acknowledge the power, the might, the awesome nature of the Saha world without being sucked into it whole. Just be amazed by it. Buddhaness. Mm. It's a paradigm shift of the mind, yes? So the lotus, the reason I named it the Sutra of the Lotus Dharma of the Wonderful Law, because Dharma most closely equates to experience. And the Lotus experience is that. It's the, that demonstrative blossoming of the Lotus at the same time that its seed pod spreads the seeds of the Lotus. Right? The seed of Buddhahood we read about constantly in Mahayana and Hinayana. In whatever period of Buddhism you want to read. But the seed of Buddhahood is described many different ways. Nichiren talks about the seed of Buddhahood as being the Daimoku. Why? Because the seed planted, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, immediately blossoms the very thing that Namu dedicated observation, invocation of Myoho Renge Kyo, the nature of the Buddhist, Buddha-ness, Buddha 
awareness, the Buddha I, hmm, happens at the same time. That's why I, you hear me say all the time, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, the Daimoku, the old Daimoku, the whatever you want to call the Dharani of the Lotus Sutra is the invocation, the actual opening of the Buddha I. Where does that Buddha I open? In your Gohonzon mind, that is the gateway, it's the eyelid of Buddha, is the Gohonzon. Hmm? And we have the perfect entry into that eyelid via this scroll, this mandala. Nichiren provided for us the entire story of this lotus invocation, which takes place in the 15th, 16th, and 17th chapters for Nichiren and is identified, dissected, if you will, in the treasure tower, the apparition of the treasure tower, the, the appearance of the treasure tower, the many names that it has, right? The, the jeweled stupa, the place where it happens, the Gohonzon mind, the treasure tower of the seven jewels, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, that's what the mandala is. So you and I can participate in this wonderful story of this incredible multitude, all of humanity, all sentient beings, all sentient minds, witnessing this, right? Remember the light coming from the tuft of hair, the top knot? It's not a flashlight. It's a sharing of mental awareness, awakening. Right? And where does that happen? It happens for everyone from this beneath the ground, the future jeweled stupa, the mandala. Representative in the story, in the physical cosmos of a mental and you can't find the mind it's an emergent property to open that eyelid of the Buddha eye it's very graphic it's very it's very obvious once you wrap your mind around the rhetoric of the story because you look at its meaning right you don't look for the eight mile high box in the sky. It's a representative symbolism to wrap your head around. So here we go. We're going to start with chapter one. And what's the first thing you have to do when you're bringing people into a paradigm shift of teaching to get them to awaken something they still don't really acknowledge that they they have the capacity for it. It's, it's built in. You don't have to go searching for it. It's already there. Just awaken it. Well, you have to show them, first of all, that you're not blowing smoke up their butts. And then you need to tell them that they're not the only ones. That this is for an incalculable, unknowable amount this is for everyone, no matter how many you think that is. But first of all, you need to say that you're actually saying it. So, as you know, Shakyamuni taught orally. He didn't write this stuff down. And the, the repetition of the verse sections of each of these monologues they're, they're posed as conversations, but they're monologues. The memorization was made, facilitated by the uh, gathas, right? The verse sections. And that's how the teaching was spread for hundreds of years. So when after his death, Shakyamuni, 
not the Tathagata's death, the extinction, which is a physical property of Shakyamuni, there had to be some awakening that Tathagata was a universal, constant, timeless entity, not an entity, because that would be a thing. It's not a thing, it's a process. It's a constantly abiding process. It is what I call the engine of life. And you can look that up in Buddhism reference. I take it apart many ways. So the first thing we read in the introduction chapter, thus have I heard, and I have an annotation here. Uh, in Pali, evam me sutam. In Sanskrit, evam maya sutam is the common translation of the first line of the standard introduction of Buddhist discourses. Thus have I heard. Attributed to Ananda, mostly, not always, but attributed to Ananda for the reason that he was known as the most excellent memorizer, I guess we would say, <laughs> the one with the most accurate memory, Shakyamuni's cousin, as the most talented memorizer of the Buddha's discourses. Ananda is likely one of several earthly transcribers of Shakyamuni's sermons. This phrase serves to confirm that the discourse is coming from the Buddha himself as a seal of con um sorry where is it as a seal of authenticity as for its use in the lotus sutra scholars suggest that like much mahayana texts assembled four centuries after the buddha's passing that this was one of the ways to establish legitimacy to the text as scholarship of shakyamuni's teachings with it insights and elucidations befitting the times and the capacity of the people. And that's my annotation in here. I will go a step further, and you've heard me say this before, that the scholarship, what you hear me say all the scholarship, the scholarship of Buddhism is something that Shakyamuni taught all the time, right? Shakyamuni taught orally, he also taught in a common language, not the elitist language of the, the Pali or, or the Sanskrit, sorry, or any of the, the Brahmanic uh, languages of uh, the elite. He wanted to reach everyone. It's very democratic, very pragmatic, right? What his goal from the get-go, before enlightenment, was how can we live this life fully, all of us? Right? You know the stories, you know the fables, right? Birth, sickness, old age, death, got to solve that. It wasn't about solving death or solving sickness or solving, it was about the trauma, the emotional pain, the stress, the anxiety. Life is going to be life. Trauma is going to happen. How you experience it, though, that should be within our realm of control. Yeah, birth is traumatic, but it's also amazing. So if you're fully amazed by it, do you really have to dive into the trauma of it? Do you have to be depressed about it? Can you not stay in the amazed and wonder of it? Isn't that a choice? How do we do that? How do we not get sucked in? How do we not make some injury into a life-ending proposition? How can we just get through that injury and heal and move on? Isn't it a, a mental awareness, a mental process? Hmm. In an age where you and I live in an age now, in the latter day, the Mapo period, where we have 167,000 different medications for feeling boo-booed. And I'm not belittling it. I've dealt with depression myself. Not just depression, 
all manner of difficulties just handling life. Now, Buddhism doesn't say, oh, take this magical cure, but it does say you can affect it. You can do something about it by altering your mind's experience. Right? Once the Buddha was staying at the city of royal palaces on Mount Grihatkuta, or Vulture Peak, with a great assemblage of great bhikshus, in all, 12,000. That's where we're going to begin, with 12,000 bhikshus. Now, when you see pictures of Mount, or Vulture Peak, or Vulture Mountain, it's not that huge imposing of a presence. And it has large areas around it where you could see large groups gathering. But 12,000, all of them, arhats, faultless, free from earthly cares, self-developed, emancipated from all bonds of existence, and free in mind. Well, not quite. But they've accomplished a level of nirvana. Hmm? These are accomplished bhikshus and bhikshunis, upasakas and upasikas, fourfold assembly. Yeah? And 12,000 of them, they take up a pretty good amount of the fields around that peak. But we're only beginning. So, obviously, if you take all of this literally, it won't make sense in a little while. But if you understand the implication of minds, right? We're using personages, big old bodies, assembling on this mountain. But if you understand it as a presence rather than a physical being, yeah, there's physical beings there. But they all touch, as you do, many other minds. So they're going to be added and included on and on and on as we progress. Because this teaching is for every single, not just existent sentient mind, but sentient mindness to come. This is it. This is the big teaching, the ultimate teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha. So we have to build this audience slowly, lest we leave everyone behind and go, okay, this is impossible. I don't get it. Blah, blah, blah. Right? So we have to build slowly. Imagine this. Imagine this. So this, we're just starting out. Chapter one, introduction. And I have a rather long annotation here. Remember that an arhat or an arhant is a monk whose practice is dominated by the idea that nirvana is a personal accomplishment of samsaric realization. Still in the saha realm. Additionally, this nirvana does not lead to the ultimate goal of Buddhahood in this life. That's the early teachings, right? For the Arhat, Buddhahood is not accessible in this lifetime, or for that matter, within the foreseeable future, requiring multitudes of lifetimes to attain. There's that old Hindu stuff. It doesn't belong here, but it's been dragged along, shoehorned into Buddhism for over 40 years of Shakyamuni's teachings, no matter how much he taught about emptiness and not-self and uh, impermanence and so on and so forth. Okay, yeah, we hear you, but we'll be born again, right? In the future, future lifetime, right? Ugh. Okay, you're so stubborn. Let me give you this provisional goal of nirvana. At least then you can get on board and start learning. And hopefully by the time you learn at a certain level, you'll take that apart yourself. Well, they didn't. So when we got to the Lotus Sutra, the last eight years of his teaching, he said, okay, I'm not, I'm not talking to your capacity anymore. Screw your capacity. This is how it is. This is what it is. Do it or don't, but this is it. This is Buddhism. This is what all of this is about. Either get on board or, you know, 
you're not going to get there. And that's your doing, not mine. So the lotus, very important for two reasons. A, the lotus example, renge, immediate enlightenment when you invoke it, because it's already there. It's like an alarm clock. Wake up! Namum yo renge kyo! Buddha! Hmm? Oh boy, really? That can happen? Yeah. That's how I've always taught it. You just haven't been paying attention. So, very revolutionary, yeah. And then only given by an actual Buddha. So not only did they put this off into another lifetime of reincarnation, whatever, but it wasn't something you could accomplish on your own. It had to be handed to you. Well, <laughs> that's like saying uh, your uh, amygdala, uh, you don't really get to use it until a, a sanctioned doctor turns it on for you, goes in there with a, and flips the little switch. What, what nonsense. But this is what Shakyamuni had to deal with. These people who just were so infuriatingly stubborn holding on to these mythologies yeah so he had to reinvent a bodhisattva with the lotus that could flip the switch and to their credit the people in the assembly who were listening almost all of them got that <gasps> wow to a point and you'll see as we go how it goes on So I'll continue with my annotation here. This second millennium of uh, the Buddha's teaching is known as the counterfeit age of the Dharma for this false impression of or goal of personal nirvana. As we progress in this sutra, the Lotus Dharma teaching, we'll illustrate this point in one of the seven famous parables in chapter 7, the parable of the conjured or apparitional city. Shakyamuni will make very clear that the Arhats accept they have achieved what they in fact have not achieved. This is because the nirvana that they were taught was the limit of their capacity to understand without quitting or turning back as illustrated in the travelers in the parable. The parable. The true nirvana would come after greater effort along the bodhisattva path to aspire for full and complete nirvana of the Buddha mind realized in this very lifetime and quickly. Nichiren, of course, understands this as the very invocation of the sutra itself and thereby Buddhahood by chanting the title with self-dedication via Namo Myoho Renge Kyo as the seed and blossoming of Buddhahood all at once. Right? That's Nichiren, our teacher, our mentor, our exemplar. Yes? So, now back to chapter one. Their names were An Ajnita, Ajnata uh, Kundin, uh, Kaudinya, Mahakashapa, Uruvilva Kashyapa, Gaya Kashyapa, Nidi, Nadi Kashyapa, Shariputra, Maha Madagalyayana, Maha Kachayana, Anirura, Kapina, Gavapi, Gavampati, Revata, Pilindavasta, Vakula, Maha Kashtila, Nanda, Sundarananda, Purna, son of Mayatreya, Subhuti, Ananda, and Rahula, all such great arhats, are well known to everyone. Well, most of them are anyway, right? <laughs> to us. In addition, there were 2,000 under training and no longer under training. Hmm. Subhuti, Ananda, and Rahula, yeah, 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 under training, oh, blah, 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 blah. Shaiksha and an Ashaiksha, that is undergraduates and graduates. <laughs> the footnotes are fun sometimes. 
The Bhikshuni Mahaprajapati with 6,000 followers. The Bhikshuni Yashodara. Now, Bhikshuni, those are the female nun, the nuns, right? The female monks. So they're also there. I mean, you notice the descriptions, the inclusion of people, it's growing. Yasharada, the mother of Rahula, also with her train of attendants, there were 80,000 Bodhisattva Mahasattvas. Oh, from 12,000, so we now have 80,000 additional Mahasattva Bodhisattva, all free from backsliding in regard to perfect enlightenment, all having obtained Dharani, all endowed with knowledge of eloquent discourse or skillful means and rolling the never-retrogressing wheel of the law, who had paid homage to countless hundreds of thousands of Buddhas under whom they had planted all the roots of virtue, constantly being extolled by them, who cultivated themselves by charity, entered well into the Buddha wisdom, penetrated the greatest knowledge, and reached the other shore, whose fame became universally heard in innumerable worlds, they being able to save numberless hundreds of thousands of living beings. Their names were Bodhisattva Manjushri, Bodhisattva Regarder of the Cries of the World, the Bodhisattva Great Power Obtained, the Bodhisattva Everzealous, so on and so forth. So. And uh, the Bodhisattva's Precious Store and the Bodhisattva Leader, such Bodhisattva Mahasattvas as these, 80,000 in all. It's getting hard to keep track of how many people here. At that time, there was Chakra Devendra, Devan, Devendra with his following of 20,000 transcendent sons. There were also the transcendent sun, Excellent Moon, the transcendent sun, Universal Fragrance, the transcendent sun, Precious Light, the four great heavenly kings with 10,000 transcendent sons in their train the God Sovereign, and the God Great Sovereign, followed by 30,000 transcendent sons, Brahma Heavenly King, the Lord of the Saha World, Great Brahma Shinkin, and Great Brahma Light, and others. With their following of 12,000 transcendent sons, there were also the eight dragon kings, the serpents from the under the sea, yeah? Nanda Dragon King, Upadanda Dragon King, so you can read all these names with some hundred thousand followers, each revered by um, revered at the Buddha's feet, retired and sat to one side. Right, This whole procession just keeps growing and growing of the many personages, types of minds, types of thinking. Yeah, Think of these personages as having all different world views, just as we do today, right? Any 10 people, you assemble. look at the fountain analogy in the first, uh, in, um, sorry, they're combined now, uh, volumes one and two of Buddhism reference, right? In the analogies in the back of the book. That's what this assembly represents, is every kind of sentient mind, every kind of worldly experience, every kind of, instantiation, poor, hungry, beautiful, real, wealthy, middle, whatever, doesn't matter. A mind is a mind is a mind. What you experience in the Saha world is colored by your samsaric experience, interpretation, conjuring. With Buddhaness, we're going to alter that for everyone equally to the best possible manifestation of your potential. Buddha. Keep coming back to that. Don't forget that that's the lesson. At that time, the world honored one, surrounded, revered, honored, and extolled by the four groups, taught for the sake of the Bodhisattvas the great vehicle sutra called Innumerable Meanings. The law by which bodhisattvas are instructed and which the Buddhas watch over and keep in mind. Is that not an explicit admission that the innumerable meanings has always been about the Lotus Sutra? 
with its innumerable meanings. That's why this assembly includes every type of personage, of embodiment of a sentient mind. Hmm? Having taught this sutra, the Buddha had sat cross-legged and entered the contemplation termed the station of innumerable meanings. I have to imagine he was just concentrating on the Lotus Sutra in his samadhi, in which his body and mind were motionless. To the observer, I mean, can, any, can you see anyone's mind at work? Sometimes we say, we can, I can see the wheels turning in there, right? But if you sit closed-eyed and focused concentration, Somebody asked me recently, can you chant quietly? Can you do gongo quietly? Of course. It's a mental action. Now, by using all of your skandhas, all of your sensation organs, your consciousnesses, via sight, sound, oral, feeling, breathing, tongue, right? You invoke every aspect of your consciousnesses on the Buddha-ness, well, then you're going to fulfill that goal very instantly, very quickly, yes? Doing it quietly, of course, has value. But it's not as profound or as immediate because we are samser or saha beings. We are physical beings. And the only place to experience Buddhahood is in the mind. But that mind is constantly being battered by samsaric thoughts. The monkey mind. And the best way to shut the monkey mind down is to preoccupy it. So we use the mandala, thank you Nichiren, to focus our sight consciousness so our eyes aren't darting around the room watching every monkey going, look over here, look over here, look over here. I'm important, I'm important. No, this is important, right? Nyoho, that's where we're going. In this instance, in this instance, moment, 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 moment. Hmm? And do I hear that dog barking outside or the birds or the wind? What I hear is my, the sound of my voice in strong repetition and rhythm so I can feel the rhythm, so I can say the rhythm, so that I can hear pronunciation. All of my senses geared into one direction. Enlightenment, Buddha me, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, right? Now, we can do that silently. Of course. And perhaps, after years of practice, you can do it silently and shut down all the monkeys as well. Congratulations. But far easier, far more effective is to challenge the Saha world at its own level, its own presence. Hmm? So if you're starting out, I encourage you, if you can, yeah, set aside a special space, an uninterrupted space. No other baubles or things to look at. Only Myoho should be primary in your visual field, right? It's in the enshrinement ceremony. I have it online. I have it in the books. You know. All right. At this time, the sky rained Mandarava, Mahamandarava, Manjushaka, and Mahamanjushaka flowers over the Buddha and all the great assembly, while the universal Buddha uh, world shook in six ways. Do you ever feel like you're vibrating when you're chanting? Hmm. Then in the congregation, 
bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, upasikas, universal realms of influence, dragons, yakshas, gandharas, all these personages of influence. The 3,000 realms. Mm -hmm. As well as minor kings and the reared wheel uh, turning, uh, rolling kings, all of this assembly, obtaining that which had never been before, with joy and folded hands, folded hands, and with one mind looked up to the Buddha. Then the Buddha sent forth from the circle of white hair between his eyebrows a ray of light, which illuminated 18,000 worlds in the eastern quarter so that there was nowhere it did not reach downward to the Avicii hell and upward to the Akashnitha uh, uh, heaven, in this world were seen in those lands and all their, um, uh, all their living creatures in the six states of existence, likewise, the six lower worlds, likewise, were seen the Buddhas existing at present in those lands, and there could be heard the sutra laws those Buddhas were teaching. There could also be seen there bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, and upasikas, who had practiced and, and attained the way, they were on the path. Further were seen the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, who walked the Bodhisattva way from various causes, with various discernments in resolve, and with various appearances, all types of people. Likewise were seen the Buddhas who had entered final nirvana, and were seen, and there were seen the stupas made of the precious seven jewels for the relics of the Buddhas, which were erected after the Buddhas entered final, final nirvana. Now, this introduction chapter, be conscious of the fact that it's jumping all over time right now. Because some of this stuff doesn't make sense already happening. So, in a way, it's a second prologue, but it's much more condensed. So it looks as though, yeah, another annotation. We're just getting started, so I'm trying to set the stage for you appropriately so you understand how this sutra is constructed, yes? There are two things of note here that are helpful to consider. The first is the long list of people in the assembly are classified by their unique levels of practice and stature in the community of monks Students devoted to Buddhist practitioners, these people are often, if not all, actually types or personages that embody the nature of human existence or sentience. As such, we should remember that Buddhism is a philosophy of the mind, the primary subject of which is human attitude and intent. This assembly will continue to grow to unimaginable dimensions as the sutra progresses. This becomes a nod to the ever-growing profundity of this ultimate teaching for all of sentient beings throughout time, which we will also read as a construct that is broken and used to demonstrate the samsaric mind's inability to comprehend the timeless nature of the engine of life. Secondly, also mentioned as in passing here, is the stupa of the seven jewels. Already, it hasn't even appeared yet, but this is the unmistakable reference used by Nichiren to establish the universal stupa of our modern day Butsudan, containing the seven jeweled treasure tower of Namo Myoho Rengekyo. See the appendix B for more on the seven jewels. That's an interesting appendix, and that's in the back of this book. Anyway, more on this later. So now we'll continue with the introduction. Where are we time-wise? Oh, I rattle on and on and on. At that time, my Atreya Bodhisattva reflected thus. So now we're going to really start getting into the the format Nietzsche uses it all the time, the, the, the Q&A, right? The question, the back and forth that's it's really shocking when you're talking, but he's going to take on the personage of these different personages, like Maitreya, with their following and what he's taught before about these people and their uh, qualifications. 
and ask questions as though from them in order to provide answers to those in an assembly that's huge to answer questions for people who may not have either the wherewithal or the ability or the vicinity <laughs> to ask the question. He knows what everyone is thinking, so he's going to respond to obvious questions people might have. And we're just getting started here. So the questions are going to be rather interesting, a little bit far-ranging maybe. And this is how the Lotus Sutra formally begins. Again, thank you for listening. We're just getting started. This is going to be a lot of fun. And uh, my goal here isn't just to have fun. It's that I present this Lotus Sutra to you in a way that engages you, that makes you think about your own thoughts, so that from that, you can not only glean meaning, but get your own insights. And that's, that's Buddhism. Buddhism is about, look, look in your mind, look at how it's working, and ask yourself, Ask yourself, what if? And from those insights, your life, your experience of your life will change. Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Please take care of your health. Keep your practice strong and your resolve as well. And I will see you in the next one. All right. Bye for now.